Hi viewers, this is Angela Murjani from Kasturba Gandhi College and I bring you greetings from Hyderabad. I do hope you're going to enjoy doing the poem that I have planned for you for this day. It's a short poem by Christina Rossetti. However, it is extremely profound and thought-provoking. Christina Georgina Rossetti, who lived from 1830 to 1894, was an English poet who wrote a whole variety of poems, ranging from romantic and devotional ones to children's poems. However, she is best known for her long poem entitled Goblin Market. Christina was born in London to an Italian family that was gifted in the arts. Her father was a poet and of her three siblings, one was the well-known poet and painter Dante Gabriel Rossetti and the other two, William and Maria, were both writers. Dante Gabriel Rossetti founded the Pre-Raphaelite School of Poetry and William, together with a couple of friends, established a literary journal called The Germ. Christina began to contribute poems to this journal, writing from a very early age. Her poems are best known for their symbolism and intense emotional quality. She is being increasingly recognized as a significant poet of the Victorian era. Although she fell in love on more than one occasion, Christina never married for religious differences. After the age of 50, she was struck with a debilitating disease that restricted her social life. This disease brought so much suffering and pain into her life that henceforward her life was one of loneliness and isolation. A lot of that pain that she experienced because of this physical ailment expresses itself in her poetry. Finally, Christina was struck down by cancer and she died in 1894. Christina Rossetti is widely perceived as a pre-Raphaelite poet and that is because of the striking resemblance between the qualities of her poetry and the specific attributes of the pre-Raphaelite school. The picturesque representations in her poems, the natural beauty that is captured in exquisite imagery, her recreation of a medieval atmosphere with all its settings, the recurrent theme of love and the extreme sensitivity to the emotions and the mysticism that dominates her poems. All of these features, except her religious fervor, mark her out most arguably as a pre-Raphaelite to the core. Now let's get better acquainted with Christina Rossetti by having a closer look at her poem called Uphill. Uphill by Christina Rossetti Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the day's journey take the whole long day? From morn to night, my friend. But is there for the night a resting place? a roof for when the slow dark hours begin. May not the darkness hide it from my face? You cannot miss that in. Shall I meet other wayfarers at night? Those who have gone before. Then must I knock or call when just in sight? They will not keep you standing at that door. Shall I find comfort, travel sore and weak? Of labor you shall find the sum. Will there be beds for me and all who seek? Yea, beds for all who come. The poem follows the structure of a dialogue or a question and answer session. This dialogue could possibly be between two people or it could also be happening within the mind of the poet herself where she asks the questions on the one hand and finds the answers within herself. The poem very aptly describes the condition of the heart and mind of the poet and it represents to us her deep doubts concerning her system of belief. 
there is here a very great paradox because while there is a storm of doubt raging around the poet in her mind, she is able to find the solutions and the answers from deep within herself. So the poem could very well be seen as the recording of an internal dialogue which is put on paper for the benefit of other fellow travellers who are on the journey of faith. These doubts that are very common to all believers may sometimes find their answer and their solution in faith itself. Faith will supply all the answers that such a traveller needs while they are along the way. The dominant image in the poem is one of a journey. Now the metaphor of a journey is common enough in poetry, but Rossetti gives it a different twist by calling it an uphill journey and she thus adds a very interesting and unique dimension to it. The journey operates at two levels. One is the journey of life, this world, this earth and all the difficulties and all the troubles and the challenges which people face in the course of life on this earth. And it also talks about another journey, a deeper journey, which is the spiritual quest which is undertaken by a large number of people and this desire to reach to a higher level of spirituality which is also fraught with difficulties and troubles. Now let's take a deeper look at the poem, examining its themes, its symbolism and its structure. And we will do this by looking at each of the questions and the answer which comes to those questions individually. The poem starts on a note of apparent fatigue on the part of the speaker. The speaker seems so tired with the never-ending struggles of life. As I said earlier that the poem follows the structure of a dialogue, it begins with a question and the questioner has a very pertinent and important question and that question is, will the troubles of this life never end? Will they never cease? Will the struggles of this journey of everyday turmoil and difficulties and sorrows, will it never ever come to an end? The poet wishes to know, will life ever be easy and simple? In addition to the fact that this journey is uphill all the way, the poet lets us know that it is a winding road. Now we know that winding roads are never straightforward and they always take longer for the traveller to get to their destination. So in spite of all the troubles, the journey of life is lengthened by the winding roads that one has to cross. To this, the one who answers has this to say, that essentially this is the nature of life. Life is full of struggles and will be so even unto the end. One should not expect it to be any different because in this expectation one would set oneself up for disappointment. There is however one redeeming feature and that is that at least there is a road. This means that the traveller does not have to create their own road. Previous travellers who have walked down that pathway have beaten a track out so that now the ones who want to travel have only to follow the beaten track. Those that have gone before have in a sense pointed out the way to the future travellers and so all that travellers have to do now is follow the path even though it may be a difficult one. In line 3, the speaker asks about the length of the journey and is told in return that the journey will last for the whole day. If we take day to be a metaphor for a life, then we can understand morning to represent the birth of an individual and night to stand for his death. Therefore, if the journey will last for a whole day, that means this difficult, arduous journey of life will last right from the time of our births and end only with our deaths. 
Having spoken about the hardships of life in the last two lines, the poet wonders how long must she endure these difficulties? And the answer that comes from the one who responds is that there is no reprieve for life. We are in it for the long haul and right up until death will these difficulties last. Line 5 expresses the anguish that the poet experiences upon hearing this response. She wonders, will there be no resting place even for the night? Her concern is that, what if the difficulties of this life continue even unto death? She is very troubled, wondering if there's going to be no break in the hardships that she's facing at all, even after this life is over. To this, the answer is much more hopeful and optimistic. Yes, there will be a resting place. And yes, it will be provided at the right time. It will be provided when night comes. If we understand night to mean death, this means that rest comes only at the moment when death occurs. It cannot be a moment too soon and it will not be a moment too late. The inn is a symbol of heaven, which is a resting place for all who are dead. In this resting place, those who have suffered much tribulation and hardship in life will find the rest that they never did find while they were on this earth. They will receive that rest in fullest measure, but only after death has come. Now, there is a kind of play with opposites here. In other words, while we are living in this world, we have much work to do and will experience very little rest. But once we are dead, we will experience all the rest we need and want and there won't be any work to do at all. The poet's question is reminiscent of an incident which happened in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 and verse 7 when Joseph and his wife Mary, heavily pregnant with the Christ child Jesus, went to an inn and they wanted to stay there for the night, but there was no room for them in the inn. Hence, the poet's doubt. If there could be no place in the inn for the mother of the Christ child, would there be place for her? However, Hope resurges in the heart of the poet when she remembers the Gospel of John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 in which Jesus said to his disciples that in his father's house there were many mansions and many rooms and he was going ahead of them in order to prepare a place for them so that where he was they might also be. This philosophy reflects a school of thought which very specifically understands life to be full of difficulties and troubles, but a time will come for such believers when all their tears will be wiped away and there won't be any sorrows any longer. This is mentioned in the book of Revelations in the 21st chapter verse 4 and you can look up these verses later if you would like to. In line 7, the poet expresses a doubt whether the darkness might obscure the inn from her view. Now, if you take darkness to stand for something which is unknown, death is also an area which is covered with great ambiguity. So the author is very worried about whether she will miss the inn or not. Having gone through so many problems and illnesses and suffering in her life, she does not want to miss this opportunity of entering into the inn when she does pass it by. There is also a slight doubt expressed here about whether or not the poet will know when death comes to her. The one who answers the poet comforts her and reassures her that she cannot miss it. She will not miss it. And this brings great peace to the heart of the poet. Her confidence resurges because now she knows that all that she has gone through will come to an end at that moment of night when she passes from life into death or when she enters into the inn.
Now that the questioner has received this wonderful reassurance of comfort, she is emboldened in line 9 to ask yet another question of hope. And that question is, will there be other travellers like herself who are travelling in the night? Now through this question, the poet seems to suggest that no experience of any human being, no matter how difficult, no matter how fraught with difficulties, is unique to that individual. All human beings go through the same pain and the same suffering. Although at that time, when an individual is going through something that's really hard, they feel like they are the only ones who are in the pit of such sadness and sorrow. They look at the world and they think everybody else out there looks so happy. Nobody else has all the problems that I have. Why am I the only one who is suffering in this manner? But through this question, the poet wants to present this fact of life that the human situation has this in common that all of us go through the same difficulties and the same hardships. So the answer to the question which the poet asks is yes there are other people who are traveling. There are many who travel this pathway of life along with us and there are many who travel the pathway of death as well. Those who have been through the journey of life must also go through death one day or the other. There is the additional implication here that is very founded in Christian scripture that those who have gone before, near ones, loved ones who have died before will be on the other side waiting for us when we arrive. So there seems to be that implication in the poet's question. Will there be others who are waiting for her? And the answer is yes, those who have gone before will be on the other side and they will be waiting for the arrival of the poet. In line 11, the poet seems to be riddled with doubts and questions as to what is going to happen in her future. What is going to happen to her once this life is done with? She wonders that if she arrives at the door of the inn, will anybody even notice her? What should she do once she goes there? Should she knock? Or should she call and shout out loud? What if nobody notices her arrival? Will that mean that the journey of life will continue? That the endless sorrow and difficulty which she experienced in life must go on and on now because nobody answered the door for her at the inn? These are some of the questions that the poet has. The answer that the poet gets to this volley of questions is that she will not be made to wait at all. There is complete reassurance in the voice of the one who responds and he says that there will be no waiting. This is definitely the end of her journey. The reference to the door in line 12 takes us back again to the teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 where he says to his disciples that all those who knock, to them will the door be opened. This is a direct reiteration of the doubt and the answer which were experienced by the poet. Having been comforted that indeed her entrance at the door would be the end of all the travails and difficulties of her life thus far, the poet is now emboldened to ask even more questions. And the question which she presents now is, Will there be any recompense for all the difficulties and all the hardships that she had borne while she was living in the earth? She exclaims that she was sore from her travels. She says that her emotions had been badly wounded. Her feelings had been bruised. Her life had been full of misery. And she wants to know, will there be any recompense made now that she would arrive in heaven? Was there going to be something in heaven that would have made her journey of life worth it after all? It appears that the poet held a dear belief in her heart that all the struggles of her life would be compensated at a later stage. She held a hope in her heart that at some time there would be a reward in the afterlife for all that she had gone through in the earthly life. And this belief had sustained her through all of her problems and struggles on the earth. 
the answer that the poet gets is both sobering and reflective of the quality of divine mercy which is so characteristic of Almighty God. The answer tells her that she can expect to get an exact recompense for all that she had endured on this earth. If one had gone through great sorrow, then they could justifiably expect to receive immense joy. If one had worked very hard, then they could definitely expect a reward for their hard work. If one had given either materially or spiritually in abundance, then now they could expect to receive by the same measure in which they had given. This line takes us back to the opening of the poem which suggests that the journey of life is uphill or something which involves a great deal of work. So if life equals hard work, then the reward of that hard work can be expected, the poet seems to suggest. Here, hard work is taken into account. Every least bit of it is accounted for and in the measure of recompense and comfort that one can expect to get, all of the work that one has done is accounted. The reward will be in direct proportion to the labor put in while on the journey. In fact, it will be the sum or the total of all that labor. This is a very comforting thought to those who feel that they have worked very hard in this life and received little or no recognition or reward for it. So one can expect that the reward is stashed away for them and is forthcoming at a later date in their journey of life. In line 15, the poet dares to ask one more question. Will there be comfort for all who desire it? The focus here is on the keenness or the very interestedness in the people who want to enter in. The focus is not so much on whether they have deserved it or whether they have earned it or whether they have any right to claim it. It appears that this last doubt stemmed from the fact that the poet knew herself to be a genuine seeker. Whether or not any other disqualifications would step in the way of her achieving this in was what was troubling her at this point in time. The answer which the poet receives is extremely heartening. Yes, there will be beds for all. There will be eternal rest for all who desire to come in. Beds symbolize rest after a hard day's work. They also symbolize recovery, revitalizing, and they symbolize also the rejuvenation of our spirits. So in saying that there will be beds for all, the poet is now staking a claim that there will be rest for everybody who desires it. In conclusion, the poem works as a powerful metaphor for the journey of life, representing the journey of this earthly existence and also the journey into the afterlife. In this life, after all the travails, suffering, difficulties and problems that one faces, death brings a release. Death brings a much awaited and needed rest. Spiritually speaking, as the poem is written from a Christian background, the hill represents the hill on Calvary where Christ was crucified. The journey to this hill is fraught with difficulties. But once a traveler comes up to the top of the hill, that is his moment of encounter with faith. And after that, there is only rest for him. At a third and structural level, the poem is also a journey which begins with despair and ends in hope. It begins with questions where the poet actually doubts herself and expresses her unbelief and then begins to find her faith through answers which are grounded in the promises through which she can find a guarantee of faith and peace. So within the metaphor of the poem, the poem also accomplishes a journey of its own, moving from hopelessness and despair to trust and peace. In its progression, it points to two other worlds, the realm of the spirit 
and the earthly world, but it does not do this without first accomplishing the journey within itself. I'm certain that all the people who are listening to this poem today will be heartily agreeing that this is true because if you look all around you, there is so much of sorrow, so much of suffering in the world. But young people, don't be discouraged. These are words of caution that you may be prepared. Life is not a bed of roses, it is true. But this poem is meant only to encourage you that life, yes, is indeed full of challenges. And around you, you have everything that you will need to equip yourself, not just to face the challenges, but to overcome them in triumph.